Please, won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. Does, any, does anybody know the name of the woman who is the, um, who works in the drive through at Dunkin' Donuts, who comes to the window most often? Do you know who I'm talking about? This is my, the, the nicest woman ever. Do you know who I'm talking about? Dennis, do you, Melody. I think I've heard that before too. I think she used to babysit for um, Sean O'Reilly's kids, so he told me her name once, Melody. So Melody um, greets me every morning. I mean, I'm embarrassed about the amount of times I go to Dunkin' Donuts. But I, I just wanted to tell you, I was thinking about this morning when I went to Dunkin' Donuts and Melody handed me my iced coffee and called me beautiful like she does every morning. Um, the day that she removed her mask, that Dunkin' Donuts removed their masks, I don't know what day that was, but I wept when I saw her smile again. Do you, any of you have these weird moments of weeping when you see people smile right now? I wept when I saw her smile again. Um, and she, she always says things to me like, your skin is so beautiful. It's like you're lit from within. You know, she, she says things to me like that every morning. And I just, like, I just needed to see her smile again. Um, it just, anyway. So I was thinking about how important she is to me and how I don't even know her name. And um, how she sees me, even though she doesn't know me. And how I feel like I belong just from her smile. And so I wanted to talk today to all of you a, kind of a, a collection of thoughts about belonging and belonging in Christ. And I hope it makes sense. <laughs> Oprah Winfrey says that invariably at the end of every interview that she ever does, the same question is always asked. It doesn't matter if she is interviewing like the world's leading expert in any given subject or people on death row or the President of the United States, they always ask her some version of the same question at the end of their interviews. Can anybody guess what it is? How'd I do? Yeah. Was that okay? How'd I do? Right? Some version of that. They all want to know, Oprah says, did you see me? Did you hear me? And did what I say matter to you? How'd I do? Did I do okay? Sometimes Oprah says she just tells people, like at the commercial break, you're doing great, you're, you're, you're okay, just to preempt the question. But that universal need to the human experience, that deep need to be accepted exactly as we are, that longing to belong, is central to our development and it is central to our safety and it is central to our feeling loved and flourishing. St. Paul likes to use the phrase in Christo a lot. It means in Christ to describe our cosmic reality. You saw this in his letter to the Ephesians this morning. I think he says in Christ six times in just those two paragraphs alone. In Christ, we are not separate from God. From the beginning and until the end of time, we are in Christ. All things, he says, are gathered up in God. All things, the people of the earth and the earth itself, are gathered up in in God, things in heaven and things on earth, all of it belonging to God as a plan for the fullness of time. So the plan for the fullness of time is belonging. Belonging in Christ, in Christ, means belonging to each other and to the earth. And belonging is part of God's plan for humanity. 
belonging and being loved are core to how we relate to the world. Padre Gotuma translates the Irish phrase for trust in this way. Irish phrases are very long. So the word trust, he translates like this. You are the place where I stand on the day that my feet are sore. Trusting that we belong is the place from which we can explore our world with curiosity and with open hearts. If we do not have that trust in the place where we stand and in that belonging, we cannot love and be assured that we are loved. And we can all tell a story about a time when we didn't belong, right? going to ask you to think about a time in your life when you felt as though you didn't belong. It could have been in your family of origin. It could have been at school, middle school, <laughs> church. I have so many stories about times when I didn't feel as though I belonged. Gatherings at family reunions in which I was the only girl cousin in the summer of 1995 when I was a hippie camp counselor among sorority girl camp counselors at sleepaway camp. I know it's hard to believe that I was a hippie once, but I was. I listened to the Indigo Girls and everything. <laughs> My feelings were the same each time. These people don't know the real me. They don't want to. And therefore, I don't matter. This place is dangerous. And my response to those feelings of alienation is what you do when you sense danger, right? It was to retreat. Retreat and never go back to that place or retreat inside my head or retreat into my bedroom or whatever it was. The loneliest I have ever felt in my life has been among people. Maybe that's true of you too. Glennon Doyle has a new podcast that is aptly titled, We Can Do Hard Things. I stole that phrase from Glennon Doyle. <laughs> and this week, her podcast had a gay listener who wrote in and asked Glennon, what can I say to someone from my church who says that they love me, but they disagree with my lifestyle? Have you heard this? And Glennon says this, you can disagree about whether rain or sun is the best weather, and you have the right to your opinion about that. But if I tell you who I am, if I tell you that I am queer, you don't get to disagree with my identity. So let's get real clear about what you are doing, she said. You are not disagreeing with me, you are rejecting me. Do not come to me with your sweet cursive pink disagreeing. You make it sound soft and it's not. What you are asking me is, can I reject you and still love you? And what I will say to you is no. Can I reject you and still love you? No. We cannot reject people and still love them, no matter who they are. The good news of the gospel is that we are never rejected by our God. We always have access to love through God in Christ, in Christo. God pursues humanity, all of us, with relentless love. If we are to love as God does, that's our job too, especially when it gets hard. We praise God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we belong to Christ. This is the beginning of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. The human family is caught up in an us versus them dichotomy, but in this letter, the author summons believers of all nations, 
all tribes, all ethnicities, all sexualities, all genders, all political and ideological persuasions into a prayer of thanksgiving and praise to God who is all of our creator. And we are all gathered up in this love. Paul lived during a time of great political difference, persecution, and war. And instead of threatening to move to Canada, he praises God. He praises God for gathering us together despite all of our human differences. In Ephesians 2, uh, verse 14, he writes, As a Jew to a largely Gentile audience, that in Christo, God, has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. His letter to the Ephesians acknowledges that living in Christo, living in Christ with differences, requires effort. And it requires humility, and it requires gentleness, and it requires patience. I mentioned two months ago that for the first time in the history of the United States, people who say that they are members of religious institutions like churches and synagogues and mosques is now under 50% of this country's population. And many people celebrate this news, to be honest. After all, a fanatic and dogmatic adherence to religion has been the cause of division and war and genocide and sexual abuse cover-ups by religious leaders and co colonialization and irreparable harm to whole communities of people, right? But I am not celebrating. Not just because I'd lose my job. But I worry that the death of religious communities like this one will lead to more division and human suffering, and not less. For one thing, researchers have long known that church attendance and religious services are positively correlated with physical, mental, and social health. According to Jeff Jacoby, peer-reviewed studies show that regular worshipers tend to live longer to suffer lower levels of stress, to have fewer symptoms of depression, and to have better cardiovascular and immune function. Similarly, the data suggests that religious worshipers tend to be happier, to drink less, to have lower rates of drug abuse, and to give to charity and donate blood at above average rates. Amid the uniquely difficult circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic, a survey of self-reported health conditions found that Americans who attended religious services regular, regularly were the only demographic group that appeared to avoid a decline in their mental health in 2020. This is amazing research. Loneliness is a better predictor of early death than smoking, obesity, and cancer. That's why. Loneliness is a, a, a social isolation makes us physiologically, physiologically at risk for stress-related disease because we are programmed by our God or by science, I don't care what you believe, to need other people to regulate our nervous systems. Belonging is not just what God intended for the world, it's science, right? We are literally stronger together in body and in spirit. We are neurobiologically intended to be in relationship with one another. No one makes it out here alone. Our current functioning is related to our current connection with other people. And religious community at its best and we all know it isn't always at its best even this one right religious community at its best brings people of all walks of life into the same room to practice what it looks like to inhabit the kingdom of heaven people from all socioeconomic classes 
people of all races and genders and sexualities and political persuasions. Church at its best brings people together and is a little kingdom of heaven on earth so that we can practice what it means to build it in the world. And nature abhors a vacuum. The whole once filled by communities of love and accountability like this one will invariably be filled instead with bad religion. We replace love of God and neighbor with fake news and a rabid adherence to politicians and tribalistic political orthodoxy and celebrity. And we replace our noble attempts at unity and understanding with division born of hatred for people the pundits tell us that we are supposed to hate. Nature abhors a vacuum and we all worship something. And if we don't worship a principle higher than humanity, like the kind of love that calls us to welcome the stranger, to serve our neighbors, to love our enemies, to feed the hungry, to visit the prisoner, to treat the earth as though it is sacred, seek peace and freedom for all beings, not just the beings in our group, we will worship something far more sinister. Religious practice fights division with relationship, and religious community heals people with love at its best. So here is the good news. Like it or not, God has already blessed us in the heavenly places by giving us to each other, despite the forces that attempt to separate us. From the beginning until the end of time, we are in Christ. All things, he says, are gathered up in God. Things in heaven and things on earth, all of it belonging to God, to love, as a plan for the fullness of time. So liberals and conservatives, you belong to each other. You are gathered up in God black, brown, and white people, you belong to each other. You are gathered up in God. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, heterosexual people, you belong to each other. You are gathered up in God. Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, those of little faith and those of no faith, you belong to each other. You are gathered up in God. Americans, you belong to Iranians and Mexicans and Dominicans and South Africans and the Chinese people, and they belong to you. You are gathered up in God. All of us in Christ. This is the good news. All of it belongs to God. I will close with this prayer entitled Only by Tom Schumann. We sit down with our sharpened pencils to chart out the longitude and latitude of your grace, only to keep running out of paper. We tie a string around each sin, dropping them into your sea of forgiveness, only to discover we can never plumb its depths. Stop for a moment and pray for uh, the people whose sterling fire is now going to aid and save. May they be safe, may they be happy, may they be well. We scrabble and scrape, push and pummel ourselves from point to point on our self-planned journey only to find we are at the starting point of your way. How foolish we are to try to limit you by our imagination only. Amen.